<clears throat> Good evening and welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this uh, workshop on peace security, which is part of the general conference on Saturday to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the foundation of the United Nations. For those of you who have already uh, been at the previous workshops all this week, this one, this workshop differs from most of the others that preceded it in roughly two ways. Firstly, uh, this will have only a single session uh, and we will not have any breakout sessions. So instead of panels, we will have individual presenters. In a few cases, they will have videos instead of oral presentations. The second way it is different is that instead of having either a mixture or a predominance of jaded professionals and heavyweights in their fields, and after lining up several actually such distinguished professionals, we decided to have only younger people, students and professionals, to speak for the future. Actually, we want to hear, to hear them tell us what they think the world should be like, not only what it is, how it was, or what it is like now, what it will be in their own view. We have, however, made one exception, uh, an important one though, to this rule. We should have one very distinguished expert. Many of you will know him. His name is Ian Martin. He has been a shining light in human rights and in humanitarian and political affairs with the United Nations, especially over the past several decades. We hardly, he hardly needs any introduction. We should hear from him at the end of the panel presentation. And you will all get a chance to ask him questions as he has kindly offered to impart with his vast knowledge and experience. We hope you will be with us until the end. And uh, as we are in need of mutual, uh, let's say, inspiration. Before that, however, <clears throat> we shall first introduce the concept of the UN Culture of Peace Initiative. The UN Culture of Peace is very well known, but we will have a little introduction in order to understand this uh, workshop and Ian Martin can help us understand it further further on later on. Uh, you can prepare your questions already, but please don't share them in. And uh, during tonight's event, in fact, we will be using the questions, the question and answer function on the right, height, the, right, the right hand side of your screen, sorry. And this will allow you to ask questions of the speakers and the panelists. Of course, please check to see if your question hasn't already been asked by other people. You can uh, vote, uh, vote up a question, i.e. you want it to go up in the, in the list by clicking in the thumbs up icon at the bottom of each question. Please use only the question functions to ask a question during tonight's event. If you have any technical difficulties, use the chat function uh, where we can answer to you directly. We have a uh, wonderful people backstage, the uh, technical side, between Damien and Mangal. We would be using any other functions of the platform this evening, and we would be grateful if you did not use these as well. So to go back to the UN Culture of Peace Initiative, which is the basis of this workshop, as David Wardrop will explain, there are eight elements in it, and we will therefore have a short presentation on each of these elements. Each presenter has identified two proposals relating to the topic discussed, and both proposals could contribute to the world we want and a world at peace. Of these two proposals for each uh, section, we should choose one that will be taken by us to the main conference on Saturday, and hopefully it will become part somehow of the final document that we hope to present to the Secretary General on his visit to the United Kingdom in January. You will choose the one you prefer by a vote at the end of the presentation, and the voting process will come up on the screen and you can see it. During each presentation, please use the questions box on the right side. Again, I'll see it. If you see questions to support, click the thumbs up icon. So um, now to the presentations. So the first one to present the culture of peace uh, is done by David Wardrop. David, uh, again, he doesn't need any introductions for those of you who have followed our work and the work of the UNA. David, is, David Wardrop is the chair of Westminster UNA, and uh, I'm very privileged to invite him to start uh, presenting this culture. Welcome, David. Uh, 
and that's very embarrassing. Um, if we can have the first slide. <clears throat> So here is a remarkable statement by Sir Henry Maine, and it's always puzzled me. War appears to be as old as mankind, but peace is a modern invention. Sir Michael Howard, the great historian, died recently. He reckons Sir Henry Maine was right. So what is the problem with peace? I know you can't get enough of it, but would you know what to ask for? I've been looking for help in this direction for a long time. And I've always gone to libraries to see if they can help. And I go into lending libraries here and I, I ask, can, I, can you see, show me to the war section, the war shelves, First World War, Second World War, Punic Wars, Failed Wars, Succeeded Wars. Take me to your peace section. We don't have one. I've continued my search. I went to the library of the Nobel Peace Institute in Oslo who said, on one thing, make sure you never even ask us how we catalog papers. We don't know. I went to the University of Bradford Peace Library, well known. And I asked the departing librarian, how you catalog books on peace? He said, it's all up here and I'm leaving. The Carnegie Peace Library in The Hague, it's a law library, it's not a peace library. The International Peace Institute, I thought I'd arrived. We had a meeting in the library. I couldn't wait for it to finish. I said, how do you catalog your books? He said, alphabetical by author. The British Library said, go to the Library of Congress in Washington, which I did. I looked at all two and a half thousand titles which have peace in it. Wild Bill Hickok, Chicago Gangsters, Damon Runyon on Broadway, Peace from Backache, so what about the internet? You will find university reading lists, professor, professors' reading lists, or the collected, this is terrible, the collected papers of tyrants who call themselves statesmen. Anybody can call their collection of papers a peace library. So it doesn't help us. Sir Henry Maine was right, and he's still right. Bookshops and publishers don't know where to put the books on peace if they can find any, on which shelves. The publishers don't know where their audience is. So what is the problem with peace? Our sustained survival demands certainties in security on several fronts. And as we're hearing this week, good health, sufficient food, economic independence, a sustainable environment, and in this new digital world, transparency and protection of the weakest. Overriding all of these, we feel, is the need for peace. Harder to recognize and measure than good health and plentiful good food, harder to legislate for, harder to grasp, harder to firmly establish in our lives. This pursuit of peace is too often juxtaposed with preparation for war, an exercise widely analyzed and generously funded. This juxtaposition is unhelpful, debasing peace, which is an honorable state. Rather, peace is the foundation precondition for these others to become certainties. Without peace, the pace of inoculations drops. Children die. Without peace, mine clearance programs slow. Farmers can't plow their fields. Without peace, economic development plans shorten horizons. As peace becomes established, all these become easier to introduce and to embed in our culture with confidence. So this foundation precondition is not an unfocused amorphous mass, rather a combination of recognizable features which underpin the global community's coexistence. There they are, the eight elements of the UN's culture of peace. I won't read them out. And in 2000, the UN General Assembly proclaimed that the following decade would be the UN decade for the culture of peace. So that's enough from me. We'll make these short presentations as Salem has said. But in passing, we are asked to consider the roles of individuals, communities, and nation states, as well as the UN and the international community. All these are inextricably linked because peace at the top is built upon peace at the bottom. Back to you, Salem. Thank you very much, David. I'm sure you have given everybody.
everybody quite a few things to think about and uh, we will see if there are any questions afterwards. Uh, I'm, I'm inviting actually one or two questions if there are any uh, that we can ask, we can go to David now. Uh, I should move on. I'm just looking, I'm looking at things. So if we don't have any, yes, probably. Then if there aren't any questions at this time, I'm, I just uh, want to tell you that towards the end, when everyone has finished their presentations, we will still have a Q&A on the, the entire workshop. So uh, thank you again, David. And I would like now to welcome Isabella Chin, who is the uh, chair of Westminster UNA's Young Professional. And uh, she's going to introduce the section on education of peace. And of course, two of her proposals. Isabella, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Salem. Thank you, David, for your introduction as well. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's Isabella here, and uh, I'm, I'm here to represent the first topic of this um, workshops, which is education for peace. So as we all know, the in international community has acknowledged the conflict as a major barrier to the fulfillment of right to education. The UNESCO's Education for All Global Monitoring Report, Save the Children and Oxfam all state that conflicts are fundamental obstacles to the achievement of quality of education for all and also the SDGs. Furthermore, education is also a fundamental human right which develops values, self-confidence, problem-solving abilities and the critical thinking. Education can also contribute to peace through increasing life skill opportunities and ensuring the cu curriculum content promotes tolerance, justice, and the non inflammatory language. The relationship between education and peace is profound, and education has the critical role in building peace. There are many challenges we are all currently facing in this area. Firstly, lack of education opportunities and limited later life employment in some countries are core grievances that can lead to civil, a civil conflict. Similarly, grievance and tensions can be caused by unmet expectations in the form of low progression ratios between different education levels, as well as following rapid expansions in the secondary education, producing an overcapacity of high, highly educated youth for which there are limited employment opportunities. And also the perception of inequality is a well-known grievance that root of, um, and the root, root of course um, of the conflict. As access to quality education is at a premium in many countries, denial of access or exclusion because of identity, religion, or geographic location is set as a common contributor factors of conflict, which also set in the UNESCO report. So here I want to present two of my proposals, which is linked to what we're just talking about. So my first proposal is that you should undertake, uh, undertake capacity development to raise awareness on strategies for conflict prevention and peace buildings within education institutions, governmental bodies and the civil society settings. The capacity development issues for conflict prevention should aim to improve individual skills, organizations of, uh, organizational procedures, and institutional arrangement that contribute to mitigating the risk of conflict. In addition to the training education access in mediation, dialogues, and the negotiation techniques, it is important to develop a comprehensive training courses and the trainings for administrators, educational planners, or other ones on the conflict prevention measures. Capacity development um, also need to be addressed in the curriculum development to ensure that they have skills and knowledge necessary for the development of um, the education to reflect principle of peace building, tolerance, and human rights. And I'm talking about um, this capacity development, which um, is a slightly different way uh, where we um, always mentioned as uh, capacity building, because I think the capacity buildings has been uh, done quite a lot in the in the last um, decades. But there are development needed to be um, to be done on top of what we already have at the moment 
That's why I call it capacity development instead of uh, capacity building. And my second proposal, which is the UN should encourage the integration and the strengthening of the voice of youth in education system and the community as active partners for conflict prevention and peace building. Well, the education policy makers and planners can benefit from emerging thinking on how young people learn to adapt their education and the training system as part of the technical um, technological age and thereby support young people as leaders and role models in the society, both within and outside school. The youth and the voice of youth can be used and, um, um, and then can be mobilized to contribute to the conflict prevention and peace building activities with different groups. And I think the young, um, they, they can contribute as a mentors, mediators, uh, medi mediators to the young children and the peers participate in all the projects as possible. So that's two of the proposals I have been um, putting here. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you, Isabella. And um, I just wonder, there are a few questions regarding the, especially the first the, the David's uh, uh, presentation, but we will probably come back to those at the end. But I just wonder if there are any questions uh, about Isabella's uh, uh, presentation, but I think there aren't any specific ones, so I should probably go to the vote on the, the proposals. We have to select one of them. So I uh, will ask Damien to uh, start the poll now, please. 92.8. 92.8. If you, if you press the polling at the bottom. Yes. Let's move on. So the first proposal has been adopted by 92%. And uh, only 8% of the audience, of the voters anyway, for Proposal 2. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you very much. And uh, the next speaker now will be on sustainable development. And, uh, of course, she will also have two proposals like this one. I think now we have got the knack of how to... Uh, to vote on them and ask questions. Uh, the next speaker then is Andrea Prisecaru, and she is a student at King's College London, and she will address the issue of sustainable development. Andrea, welcome, and uh, please start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea, and I'm happy to be telling you the story about how sustainable development plays a role in the United Nations culture of peace. The first proposal you can vote is about a global ceasefire. The General Assembly urged for it ever since April. Action needs to be taken immediately in this direction. As UNICEF said, for 250 million children caught in the nightmare of armed conflict, a global ceasefire could be the difference between life and death. We know for sure that unless armed conflict stops, it will be impossible for people delivering COVID-related medical help to reach territories such as Libya and Syria. We also know that hospitals have been a common target for airstrikes, and even if ceasefire is achieved, humanitarian help will not be without challenges. Therefore, this resolution aims to push for a global advocacy for ceasefire. The obstacle right now is that powerful countries be bring their disagreements into council deliberations. US and Russia insist on continuing counter-terrorism operations, while China fights over having a nice paragraph referring to the World Health Organization. However, there is one resolution the General Assembly can use in its advantage. The 70 years old Uniting for Peace resolution says that when the Security Council fails to act, the General Assembly shall, co shall consider the matter immediately and use all means to maintain international peace and security. Therefore, I hope you agree that the United Nations should continue to push for a global ceasefire as stopping the spread of the pandemic is an emergency. Even if there will be difficulties, the principle behind the Uniting for Peace resolution is that there are some situations where power shouldn't play politics but make prompt decisions toward humankind. The second proposal is about Smart Sustainable Cities project, which aims to integrate technology with sustainable management strategies for utilizing resources in a more efficient way. This initiative was already embraced by many countries. We can see how in Copenhagen, street lights have official lamps adjusted on an algorithm. For example, Light is turned on when human activity is detected, but the intensity is adjusted at night to be more efficient. Uh, worldwide, Zurich and Stockholm are in the top ranks, followed by Geneva and Vienna. 
Why is this important? Because 30 years from now, it is estimated that 70% of the world's population will live in cities, so the concept of sustainable cities makes it important, as well as an efficient resolution to the world's growing population. However, cities need to need to be more prepared before they can offer a healthy life to their inhabitants, despite the economic power. Look at Paris, when one year living in the streets is the equivalent of smoking 90 packs of cigarettes. In light of this and other data, we need cities to continue to improve their infrastructure, becoming more sustainable, also sharing their knowledge with those cities in developing countries, reducing their knowledge gap. It is important to help the environment in a holistic way, from improving waste management to optimizing traffic flow and sanitation system. Some businesses have aligned with environmental goals. For example, the Rideshare Uber has committed to carbon-free rides by 2040. The Smart Sustainable Cities project resonates completely with the United Nations' seven sustainable developmental goals. Yes, some initiatives have to be global, but we need to engage communities better than we have done so far. Current disagreement between national and local government leaders in England regarding COVID-19 shows these challenges. With their engagement and leadership, an important condition for the culture of peace initiative is secured. My second proposal, encourage city leaders in richer countries to, to embrace the Smart Sustainable Cities project and similar initiatives and to share them with poor cities. Thank you for your attention. We should probably stop now. Um, I can announce the result of the poll. For the second proposal, 71%, and for the first one, 29%. So we go for the second proposal. The next speaker is uh, on equality of women. David is standing in for some, some friends. Thank you again, David. And uh, it's on equality of women. Please, the floor is yours. So for 40 years, conventions relating to women have tended to focus on their protection. But things began to change in the 60s the Commission on the Status of Women in 1969 talked about women and children being afforded special protection during conflicts. And in 74, uh, women and children in emergency and armed conflict. In 75, starting women started to be on the front foot, greater women's participation in security. And 95, 1995, the Fourth World Conference on Women, wanting demanding more women placed in the highest levels of decision-making in peace and security. But as many here know, the year 2000 was the landmark. The UN Security Council 1325, a number which all of us just have stuck in our memory now. This turned everything upside down. The challenge was perceived as not the protection of women, but the involvement of women in the solution. So what happened then? The UN's member states did nothing. But in 2005, Kofi Annan called them out and demanded they develop action plans. UNA hosted the public announcement of the first British action plan that same year. Nations were slow, but the UK NGO Security Women judges that 83 countries now have viable action plans to uh, implement Security Council Resolution 1325. So how far have we progressed? In 1993, women pe made up 1% of peacekeeping personnel, and now they're 6% and 10% in UN police. Controversially, the 2028 target for women serving in the military contingent is 15%, and those in the police, 20%. Some countries have pushed back on these ambitious targets, but the UN is determined. However, women need to be treated differently. In the field, delivery has been falling short. In fact, today, Thursday, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe is discussing this very same issue, worried about the security of its female staff in the front line in the Ukraine. In fact, they just published a book, Women on the Contact Line. A couple of months ago, Security Council resolution, yeah, the Security Council does take decisions which make sense and, and, and are uh, agreed by all, gives clear direction on how to increase the deployment of women in peacekeeping, national databases, support for mixed engagement teams, best practices for recruitment, retention and training, and what's new also, better accommodation, sanitation, healthcare, protective equipment, better security and privacy. We're back on track, but we must be vigilant. Why? Because women are a force for peace. So that's the first 
proposal. The second one is a mirror of that. It's, it's in the communities of those involved in post-conflict reconciliation and where those countries where the UN peacekeepers are deployed. Sustainable Development Goal 5, Gender Equality, and 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions, reference this aspect of the 1325 Agenda. And evidence from post-conflict African states supports the claim, once thought as extravagant, that there is no sustainable peace without the full and equal participation of women. The UK NGO Conciliation Resources works in Somalia, points to success here, despite that country's crazy parliament resisting one man, one vote, not fearing women, rather the demise of their clan system. In Sudan, as we watched, it was the military who overthrew the president, but it was the brave women in the marketplace who shamed the soldiers to take action. In Angola, women won a different argument, and our local and provincial elections are called zebra elections, with each party list alternating male and female. Women leaders in African states are true game changers. We must support them. So that's proposal two. It's up to you to make your choice. Thank you, Salem. Thank you very much, David. Again, uh, the proposals are there, but if I'll take any questions. There is one question for you, David. Uh, it says, what was the reason for pushback from states on targets? The, 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 the pushback was countries were not giving uh, many of the, the leading peace contributing countries are maybe not amongst the leaders when it comes to the um, emancipation of women in the field. And so there was a lot of talk saying this should happen, but the implementation, I should point out, that works for men as well, but it was more marked for women, that uh, countries were saying, I'm sorry, I'm not going to deploy women because I, I, we don't think we can actually provide them with the right facilities. These were excuses put forward. Uh, the excuses have been rejected, but it's, uh, it's still quite a battlefield in the UN peacekeeping uh, operation as to how well the, nine, the 2028 targets will be met. Thank you, David. Uh, this question was from Amy, who says she's a lawyer. And the next question I will take is Leslie is from Leslie Abdullah. And it says, women are still absent from the top peace tables. The UN has failed on implementing the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Will UNA support a call for member states to refuse to support peace mediation talks, sorry, unless 50% are women. So will the UNA support a call for member states to refuse to support peace mediation talks unless 50% of the participants are women? Well, uh, our good friend Leslie Abdella uh, can look at the results in front of, in front of you, Leslie, and um, I think there is part of the answer that uh, UNA is a listening organization or the UN is a listening organization and um, we look forward to working with you and Shevolution to make sure your ambitions uh, in our lifetime are realized. Thank you, David. I think um, we can safely go to the vote now. And I hope everybody's happy with the system now as we understand it. So uh, we can start polling now. Proposal one, vote yes. Proposal two, vote no. Thank you. 68% for the second and 32% for the first proposal. Thank you. So the second proposal has been adopted by nearly 70%. So uh, thank you again, David. And uh, the, the next section is about disarmament. Good evening, my name is Susha. When we think about peace, we often think about wars and antidotes. Indeed, Tolstoy's war and peace comes to mind. The proposals are much shorter. It seems inevitable that we come quickly to the issues of security and disarmament when discussing war. The topic is vast and so in keeping with recent UN developments, and specifically the 2017 UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, I chose to focus on nuclear disarmament. Article 11 of the UN Charter states that the General Assembly might consider principles of cooperation, including disarmament and regulation of armaments. 
There are two key proposals on how to achieve peace around disarmament. The first is to focus on what is going on in the world around us right now. In 2017, the United Nations passed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Currently, there are 84 signatories and 46 parties, yet the treaty requires 50 countries to sign it in order to achieve its ratification. I would suggest that the UN look to ongoing projects, such as the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. ICANN won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. One particularly effective strategy is the hashtag I Can Save My City campaign on social media, which encourages individuals to campaign to their local city, the local city signs up to ICANN, and in turn campaigns to the local government. So far, Paris, Sydney, Kanawha, and Nagasaki are just some of the cities to have signed up to ICANN. My second proposal ensures that nuclear weapons and killer robots are part of people's everyday understanding so that they seem relevant. We need to understand what they are, their history, their role in society today, and the ethical questions surrounding them. Most people will not engage in a topic if they do not understand it or if they do not think it's relevant. And the reality is that nuclear weapons affect us all, not just as humanity but as a planet. And therefore, we all need to know about them. Proposal 2 is inspired by work already happening by some organizations, such as Pugwash, which is currently organizing an ethical science festival for young people. Proposal 2 focuses on workshops for younger people so that they can engage in the ethical questions of nuclear weapons and killer robots. Who would run these workshops? Well, it's unlikely that one solution fits all. But in the UK, for example, there are various UN university societies across the country. Students who are members of these societies could run the workshops for younger people in the surrounding areas. This would ensure a multidisciplinary approach. So, the two key proposals. Proposal 1. Coordinated activity led by local politicians and university students to persuade city authorities join the hashtag I Can Save My City campaign, moving public opinion towards support for the ratification of the UN 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Proposal 2. Noting the adverse impact upon human development by the development of nuclear weapons over 75 years, university UN associations in the UK lead an ethics-based campaign to raise awareness of the similar dangers posed by lethal autonomous weapons or killer robots, leading to their control and their elimination. If we can now go to the proposals, please, um, then we can vote on them again. Proposal 1, coordinated activity led by local politicians and university students to persuade city authorities to join the Can Save My City campaign, moving public opinion towards support for the ratification of 2017 UN Treaty on the Pro Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And proposal two, noting the adverse impact upon human development by the development of nuclear weapons over 75 years, university UN associations in the UK lead an ethics-based campaign to raise awareness of the similar dangers posed by lethal autonomous weapons, such as killer robots, uh, leading to their control and elimination. Please vote now. I mean, you've already... And proposal one is carried by something like 73%. Proposal to 27%. So we go for proposal one. Thank you very much. And uh, the next speaker is Autumn Melody Thomas. Hi guys, my name is Autumn Melody Thomas. And first of all, I want to extend a huge thank you to everyone who is here today celebrating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations and helping to build a more secure world for future generations. I'm hugely grateful for the opportunity to speak here tonight and to contribute to the platform's workshop on cultivating a lasting culture of peace, as this issue is not only near and dear to my heart, but also as I've just spent the last several years completing a postgraduate research degree on the topic and I've come to understand what an important tool education and simple conversation can be. Specifically, tonight I want to touch on the role that human rights plays in ensuring a more peaceful and secure world through the idea of positive peace and pre-conflict peace building at the structural level through my two initiatives listed below. 
I'll begin with a quick explanation of the important role that human rights plays in the peace and security of our world. The essence of human rights is to protect the individual. We do this by affording them not only basic necessities of survival, but the opportunity to thrive in a safe and habitable environment full of dignity and free from fear. If human rights are prioritized and preserved, civil unrest vanishes, backlash against governments quell, and the need for third-party humanitarian intervention is thwarted. Regardless of the resources that peacekeeping missions may bring or the accountability that international agreements aspire to bind states to, if the underlying cause of conflict remains at the local level, violence still remains a possibility. Therefore, the preservation of human rights remains paramount to cultivating a lasting culture of peace. The most sustainable way to eradicate conflict is to target the structural factors which cause the gravitation towards violence in the first place. By preemptively addressing systemic human rights grievances and violations, issues can be peacefully resolved at the source before they reach the point of erupting into violence. Early operationalizing of preemptive conflict prevention works towards an ideal environment of positive peace, in which elevated economic and societal outcomes, paired with a diminished number of grievances, lowers levels of violence and the will to resort to violence in the first place. Positive peace can be easily understood as a society that's free from the structural problems that would lead its citizens to resort to violent action. Or, in layman's terms, violence is rendered unnecessary because there are no issues to fight over. For example, if human rights are upheld, society's functioning well, and citizens are generally happy, a peaceful environment prospers naturally. So to create this environment free from conflict igniting human rights violation takes first a clear and comprehensive understanding of what human rights means globally, what it takes to uphold these human rights, and how the international community is obligated to act when these rights become jeopardized. States must have an obligation to refrain from violations of internationally agreed upon human rights standards and further must act swiftly and decisively when violations arise before they have a chance to erupt into violence. The creation of this understanding and the will to engage in globally backed peacekeeping initiatives takes research, leadership, education, policy changes, and an overall normative will to triumph human rights as invaluable. So this brings me to my two proposals for the UN. First. I believe that we need UN-facilitated deliberative and diplomatic approaches to preemptive peace building through early identification of grievances and potentials for con vi violent conflicts. We need to pair this with early local level outreach designed by international peacekeepers in tandem with local authorities to target the area's unique issues and needs. Secondly, I believe we need to expand accountability mechanisms to defend international human rights. Building on an issue such as the uh, responsibility to protect, UN member states must accountably commit themselves to upholding human rights standards, initiating unanimous international reactionary efforts when violations begin to occur, and cultivating a normative shift towards a culture that rejects human rights violations and the resort to conflict as a viable option. The UN Peace Building Commission is the best UN mechanism to take this proposal forward, and they must be afforded the support and resources to do so. If you're interested in learning more about the idea of positive peace or the role that human rights plays in peace and security, I personally recommend Tuba Turin's book on positive peace and Michael Harbottle's Peacekeeping, Peacemaking, Peacebuilding. Thank you all so much for listening, for your support of the UN, the UNA, and humanity as a whole. Um, the question is, what early action is there to tackle the root causes of violence that stem from religious fears? I... This is a... The, 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 um, I, I think this might be something that could come up later. The, the um, involvement of faith in the UN system is, as you know, Salem, um, extremely tricky. The, uh, the UN, to a degree, runs away from faith issues. And we look at what was happening in Syria, the, the UN negotiations in Syria. There was so much involved in faith, but uh, faith leaders were kept out of those whole negotiations. I think that's another discussion perhaps for later on. Indeed, this was another question for Amy. Um, there is a, a, a direct question again from Ian Grant, and that's on the nuclear weapons. Are there any plans to invite student representatives from the nuclear weapons states to join in, even if only to pass back messages to their governments? I suppose you can answer that. Well, I think as the proposal comes from a member of a nuclear nuclear state, Ewan, my good friend, um, this will start at a university near you, and I'm sure you'll be a great uh, speaker that they'd like to hear. 
and uh, another one from Shama. How do we respond to the idea that human rights are protected by international bodies only because the countries involved would gain something out of helping? I think that's one we'll have to. Um, it's a lot. That's a long story. That one and Shama will have a long meeting about it. I promise. Okay, we can. And uh, Shama has another one about R two P, but I don't think it's. Uh, she says, is, "Is it a dead idea?" But we can we can come back to some of these questions towards the end after all the panelists have finished. So uh, thank you I just, very I much. Just say to Shama, if you go into the news pages of UNA Westminster and scroll back a couple of years, you will see what our young professionals said about that very subject, R two P. Oh, they're neck and neck practically. Uh, the second one is taking over. 5250. 5248 for the second one. 4852. Yeah, so, second proposal two wins by 52%. Picking up where I left off, in 2011, the Open Government Partnership was set up by governments and civil society advocates seeking to create a unique partnership, one that combines these powerful forces to promote accountable responsible, responsive, and inclusive governance. Today, 78 countries, including the UK, and a growing number of local governments, that's more than 2 billion people altogether, along with thousands of civil society organizations, are members of the partnership. Its implementation plan showcases successful case studies and identifies bright lights, those communities which are exemplars of reform. These could be in stable democracies, even in those experiencing civil tension, civic tension, as in the United States. If you go to our page on the festival website to see how the police department of Camden, New Jersey, can be a guide to all U.S. police departments, especially those being stressed by the Black Lives Matter protests. And this begs the question, who initiates these reforms? Who gives breath to minority groups? whose voices remain unheard. In developed states like ours, the Black, Black Lives Matter BLM phenomenon makes us ask why these issues are too often seen through the white man's lens only. Last month, a survey run by the UK journal Peace News showed the impact BLM has had on the British peace movement, prompting self-identified white readers, here's one, to unlearn a lot and to listen to other voices. The most woke community admits to not being woke. Facing quite different challenges following interfaith warfare in the Central African Republic, the NGO Search for Common Ground is now launching a 24 month project with funding from the UN Democratic Fund to promote permanent and collaborative dialogue between citizens of rival faiths civil societies and local authorities across eight districts in the capital, Bangui. A brave initiative, and even if it falters, we must watch its progress and learn from failure. Peace really is a dynamic. That is really the subject of the first proposal. But here's another one. Hold on. In the pursuit of democratic participation, youth is in danger of being excluded from proposed solutions. Recognizing this, the well-received report Stepping Stones for a Better Future, published by Together First, supports the view that when it comes to the future, younger participants and those in many developing countries tend to be more optimistic than those who are older or living in developed countries. Optimistic, yes, but is that enough? This week's news that young people in the USA, UK and Australia are questioning the value of democracy demands response and rapid in both developed and developing countries. So let us harness this pent up energy and commit to creating a UN Youth Council. Just do it. Create a high level champion for civil society itself. So that is the second proposal. Back to you. Thank you very much, David. Um, I can't see any direct questions for the time being, but please uh, do ask them if you have any. Uh, the, um, most of the, there are two questions on the responsibility to protect, but it, we can probably leave them until the end of the presentations. I'm not talking about that, David. No, we said it earlier on. 
the, no, the yes, there are two of them, and uh, and then there's uh, okay, we'll go to that. It seems the first proposal is winning by fifty one percent against forty nine percent for the second. So the first proposal fifty one percent, David. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, and uh, we now go to the free flow of information section, which is one of the other things. And of course, we will have to propose also. I would like to ask Isabella again on the stage and to, uh, you have a free flow, <laughs> bring us information. Thank you. Thank you, Salem. Uh, thank you very um, much for everyone having me back again. So now we come to another important area of the program of Culture for Peace, which is history, communication, and the free flow of information and knowledge. The original draft sent to UNESCO stated that freedom of, um, freedom of opinion, expression, and information is needed to replace the secrecy and manipulation of information, which categorize the culture of war. The free flow of information is essential to a well-informed society. Accurate and well-distributed information underpin the free market, improve human capital, provide transparency, of government decisions and improve the judicial and government decisions. The free flow of information is an attempt to account for the degree of access of information as well as the independence of that information from busted political and economic interest. In respect, um, freedom of uh, the press is also helpful in countering corruptions as greater transparency and also provide a means for increasing the oversight of resource distributions by the media. Therefore, the media can be a powerful partner for the construction of a culture of peace and its technical advance, um, advances and uh, the growth have made it possible for every person to take part in the making of the history, enable the true global movement for a culture of peace. So on one hand, it's very essential for the, for the consciousness rising and the networking that can make the transition possible from the culture of war to culture of peace, especially in the hands of the young, younger generation. On the other side, however, the media is sometimes misused to create and uh, disseminate uh, enemy images, violence, and even genocide against other ethnic and nation groups, and to portray and glorify uh, violence in many forms. Um, the control of information by the state and its commercial islands can become a chief weapon to the culture of war. In many fragile countries, fact-based, independent, transparent, accountable, and impartial report, reporting does not exist because of the business and the political interest of media owners and the lack of pay and training for the journalist. In others, it's often subject to increase the citizenship regulation and attack from parties that want to under, undermine this inference. Media can be an instrument of conflict used to um, incredibly hurt and find um, violence. As we all know, um, there are um, World Press Freedom Day that has been introduced by the UN, UNESCO and Human Rights Com uh, Commissions. Back in 1999, at the 3rd of May, which marks the last WordPress Freedom Day of 20th century. Um, they issued a joint appeal to all governments, regional and um, local authorities to renew their commitment to guarantee the safety of journalists, to ensure that the crime against the journalists do not go underpunished. They said freedom of speech is right to be fight for, not a blessing to be wished for. It's a more than that is a bridge of understanding and knowledge. It's essential for the exchange of ideas between nations and cultures, which is the condition for true understanding and the lasting cooperation. That actually leads to my first proposal, which is to encourage all government to attend the World Press Freedom Conference digital version, uh, uh, edition to 2020, which is coming this December, jointly led by the Netherlands government and the UNESCO, and to, for, the, for the government to report to their people on their determination to adhere um, to these outcomes. Well, especially for now, in times of uncertainties caused by the COVID pandemic, 
a free press is essential in helping us to cope, understand, and overcome the crisis. This will make us to more um, to, to um, all the necessary to come together um, and stand up for a free, independent press and the safety of the journalist. This is the first proposal, but also I would like to mention some other challenges we are facing for the culture of peace in this area, especially for the independent media. Many conflict and the transitional environment constitute a dis disabling rather than enabling environment for independent media to flourish. The corruption could be there, pay its low sources, either it's official or unofficial, often refused and afraid to talk to the journalist union or association. And usually it's wake and the regulatory and the legislative environment are more um, promotive than supportive of freedom of expression and freedom of the price. So that comes to my second proposal, which um, which to for the UN and its agencies to encourage media regulatory reform, where it promotes post conflict peace settlement and their implementation, and where it denies those using the media for non inclusive uh, um, <clears throat> and as discussed above, um, media regulations has been part of the political settlement in a lot of states. And the regulatory framework it needs to uh, needs to include the rules for the coverage of parties mechanism in order to include minority political and cultural interest. And also, it should include transparent guidance for setting license for the media uh, organizations and allow all media sector actors, including small and independent ones, to participate. Thank you very much for your time, and I welcome your questions. Thanks very much, Isabella. In fact, uh, your last comments uh, uh, have more or less met one of the questions that we have, and it is from, Ki uh, from uh, Mikala in the United States, and it says freedom of the press or flow of information, etc. Let me just, uh, yeah. Uh, it's regarding the freedom, the freedom of the press or flow of information. Are there any mechanisms to maintain the truth or equal representation of sides with in, in this transparent, which side with in this transparency? Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Or equal representation of sides with in this transparency? For example, the FCC fairness doctrine the US used to have. Did you get it or shall I read it again? Or can you see it? Yeah, I can see from the screen. Actually, thank you very much for the for the for the question. I think it's a is a long story to talk about, and I would like to address that at a later stage when we actually come to the discussion uh, for this topic uh, specifically. If that's okay, Salem. Yeah, fine. And uh, there's another one from. Uh, let me see. There's one from just one has arrived now. I'll go back from Anthony Valley Valley Valiant. Sorry, uh, would a clearer demarcation of hopefully factual news an opinion by media be sought somehow, where, say, a Fox News is often more political opinion than facts. I think that's where we hear actually the reason why we encourage a flow, a free flow of the information is you allow different voices to come on rather than being judgmental on a specific voice. So I guess like it links to my last question and uh, uh, the answers I want to give. So I will conclude uh, my views on that one as well. Okay, and the next one, Rara, is how is oversight of the media foreseen as necessary mitigation if upheld as a partner for promoting peace? From Amy again. Sorry, I'm trying to find the questions on the screen. Just give me okay. It's near the bottom from Amy. And it says, how is the oversight of the media foreseen if it is upheld as a partner for promoting peace? That's a very good question. Can I get back to this one as well? Okay. And uh, Tricia Rogers is asking, when you talk about the media, do you include the digital and social media, which often don't check the truth of their statements? I think so. So, um, I think there's a very good question and a very important point to address because we're living in a digital world 
and everyone now could be a creator of a source of information. And that's very important because we're on uh, social media all the days and we don't normally check and reference what the resources come from. So actually back to um, the, uh, the content that I was talking about um, is about um, first about the freedom of the expression, but also is the awareness of the responsibility behind everyone who actually talk about certain things rather than just um, the, um, um, giving the information without um, your own thoughts and judgment. I guess it's a very um, quick answer to the questions at the same time, I think I will address that more um, in depth in my later uh, discussion because I think what I mentioned about this um, younger generations to involve in more of the contribution to the free flow of information, which actually make it more and more, and more important um, because of the uh, information we share on social media. So I guess I like, will have a lot to talk about it in the later. Thank you. governments attend the World Press Freedom Conference Digital Edition 2020, which will take place on the 9th to the 10th of December, jointly led by the Netherlands government and UNESCO. And they should report to their peoples on the determination to adhere to its outcomes. And the second proposal is the United Nations and its agencies should encourage media regulatory reform where it promotes post-conflict peace settlements and their implementation and which denies those using the media for non-inclusive factionalism. And proposal two wins by 51% against 49 for proposal two. So uh, proposal two has it, <coughs> proposal two has it. Thank you, David. Tolerance and solidarity. Why tolerance? After all, it's not the rallying call we would pin on a flag if we storm the ramparts of prejudice. Here's why tolerance. <clears throat> When Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher pulled, out, pulled their countries out of UNESCO membership, its two largest English-speaking communities evaporated. In 1995, UNESCO launched the International Year for Tolerance, asking all countries, members or not, to promote its ideals. We campaigners in the UK were puzzled. How could we promote a campaign for an attitude which identified with shrugging shoulders and looking the other way? But when we learned that in French, tolerance, tolerance, uh -huh, is a dynamic concept implying curiosity in the other, a wish to understand the other side of the argument, as only then could we show tolerance, it made sense. So who do we know who needed more of the Francophone tolerance and less of the Anglophone tolerance? And I'm so pleased, Ian Simon, you put forward your question because I'm coming really, funny enough, to an answer to it. So how could we, how could we uh, handle this? It hit us then. We remembered the disastrous, Ian, the, the disastrous UK launch of the UN International Year for Disabled Persons. I was there. Every NGO claiming to have a unique challenge, shouting about it, and none were listening to each other. The year was quickly replaced by a decade, as we know. And now, 40 years later, we're still tackling these issues. But those NGOs, there for the deaf, the blind, the aged, physically and mentally handicapped, and those campaigning on gender and sexuality issues, learned to listen to each other. And guess what? They had similar challenges, one for all and all for one. They do now look after each other. Firm alliances were forged. It was they who embraced the Franco concept of tolerance and who became the greatest ambassadors of the new international year in the UK. So let's make a pitch for institutionalizing that kind of tolerance, make an effort to understand the point of view of the other, not to score points like a barrister, but to be the first who seeks a mutually agreeable solution. This is not new, but too easily overlooked. And it's a feature of a society at peace. That's the first proposal. 
Now I turn to solidarity. Those who built the United Nations 20, 75 years ago had lived through a pandemic, a global depression, genocide, and world war. They knew solidarity. In this pandemic, how far we have we reached out to countries with the fewest capacities to face the challenge? Is there much space for such stories in our media? So how are we doing? Initially, with caution, did countries choose to join the international COVAX program, sharing research, sharing access to vaccines? And as the Secretary General said, the danger of vaccine nationalism is not only unfair, it's self-defeating. None of us is safe until all of us are safe. The UK took its time to join COVAX, but now 156 countries have shown solidarity. The US still refuses as WHO is associated. But here's the difficult bit. Solidarity with whom? Take Black Lives Matter, which I've mentioned earlier. Would the images of George Floyd have gone round the world again and again as they did? Were we not going through deep inner reflection within ourselves on so many aspects of our daily life due to COVID? We see Premier League players determined to honor their commitment at the start of each match, shaming many of us. But all new concepts which address our imminent innermost feelings take time. I spoke about the International Year for Disabled Persons. It took so long. I've mentioned that it replaced, it replaced by a decade to enable legislation and public understanding too. But 30 years after that decade ended, still the job's not done. But legislation is sufficiently embedded. Black Lives Matter is a milestone in what the Age of Enlightenment Enlightenment would have termed a step forward in the ascent of man. Are we going to stick on the right path and show solidarity there? This is another difficult choice for you, I think. So uh, please vote yes for the first one and no for the second. Proposal one, there was 50, 56% for proposal one and 44 for proposal two, David. And uh, maybe we can have all the speakers now uh, address them or answer them. The first one, actually from Tamar Yankovic, says the first speaker, and I, I assume she means Andrea, stated that peace at the top is dependent on peace on the bottom. But does it ever work the other way around? I'm not sure if it's Andrea or Isabella. I think that was actually meant for me because that was my statement. We're getting your... with time, actually, um, uh, yeah. uh, Salim, we're near the end. But um, so the answer, the answer, Tamara, I have no idea. I would suspect not. Um, I, th I think you, you can't impose peace. It is the peace of the desert or the peace of the, 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 the terrible post-conflict disaster. So um, that would be my first response. <clears throat> Rosie Simons asks, poses a terrible question. Rosie Wilkham passes a question that we are naturally aggressive and selfish and etc. We kill each other. But in fact, actually, the, the culture of peace is um, based on something quite different. It's based on the scientific scientific investigation that it actually is not latent in, in, in um, humankind. But this is something I, I chopped out of it, Rose, this is for you. The, the um, preamble to the constitution of UNESCO says that, that since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And then in the year 2000, at the, at the launch of the culture of peace, Federico Mayor, the UNESCO Director General, advocated this amendment. Since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men and women that the defenses of peace must be constructed, asserting that only men start wars and that women should be seen as central to the construction of the defenses of peace. The impact of Security Council Resolution 1325, which we've been talking about, um, happened at the, at the same year and it rang out loud with us. And indeed, UK statistics, Rosie, show that when women are charged with murder, there is usually a man involved. But here's the thing, when Isabella and uh, Tricia Rogers, who's asked questions and is with us, and others, we visited UNESCO in 2018, 
we were surprised to see yet another iteration of the original preamble, filling the entire wall of the foyer of UNESCO. What it said was, since wars begin in the minds of men and women, it is in the minds of men and women that the defenses of peace must be constructed. Now, I argue that political correctness here has totally overridden scientific and historical evidence. So, in a way, Rosie, that's part of the question, answer to your question. You can, you can um, go home to your family in safety, I assure you. Yes, I was extremely fortunate to be at Amnesty International during the end of the Cold War, and it wasn't just the end of the Cold War, it was also democracy movements across Africa, the end of uh, military regimes in Latin America, democracy movements in a number of Asian countries. And for a while, I think we did allow ourselves to think that uh, uh, although there would always be some setbacks, we were on a trend that would see progressive improvement in respect for human rights. Um, sadly, we do seem to be in a period of regression. Um, country by country in terms of the rise of populist and authoritarian regimes, uh, but also at the multilateral level. Um, you referred to the human rights. <laughs> so so with times move on, I want to ask my second question because I, we, we want to have, see questions from, from the audience here. But the second one is you served at the UN in Haiti, Rwanda, Bosnia, East Timor, and finally a special representative, the Secretary General, and head of the UN support mission in Libya. Now, remembering my the, the kickoff, Sir Henry Maine saying, war is as old as mankind, but peace is a modern invention. Um, can you identify any evidence of the UN or any of us being on a learning curve in peace in the UN's responses over those years? Or are we still seeing each crisis as different to the last? Well, in a way, each crisis is different to the last. And one of the things the UN isn't always very good at is adapting its tools, its peace operations to the particular context of different countries. Um, but I, as you say, I worked in Rwanda after the genocide uh, in a human rights mission. I worked in Bosnia uh, after Srebrenica. Um, so I saw how seriously the UN had been discredited uh, by what had happened in those two cases. And that did lead to an increasing recognition uh, that the UN must protect civilians when it has the means to do so. Uh, and I believe that has resulted in improvements in the performance of, of UN peace operations. Unfortunately, in increasingly difficult contexts where conflict has got much more difficult. Um, uh, and, and I served on the high-level panel on peace operations that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon set up, and we wrestled with the question as to how today the UN can do better with conflicts that are more and more difficult. But, but I think the current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has made some significant improvements to the way the Secretariat uh, operates. He's given conflict prevention absolute priority that is right, but he's also introduced uh, uh, reforms that I think uh, have somewhat improved the operation of, of, of peace missions around the world. Uh, there are some questions coming up which we're going to fire at you, but I've, this is my last one, really, because <clears throat> um, when I joined the Westminster branch of the United Nations Association, I'd been in, in the UN Association for a long time before that. There was this uh, I. Martin with a New York um, address, and that was you, such a loyal member of UNA going back all that time. And But the only first time we met was uh, a couple of years ago, at the same time as that uh, UN Convention on the Ab Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, actually, that same month. Now, you were executive director of the really admired Security Council report. <clears throat> and I say this to everyone who's listening. Search for the Security Council report. It is the most fabulous free information of what's happening at the UN. And Ian was in charge of what was written. Um, it's independently funded by the Carnegie Corporation and the governments of 26 countries, although I see not the UK. Now, for the world's media, Ian, you were the man to go to for information on what was going to happen at the United Nations. So how did the Security Council report, and by extension you, had, you had such entree into what 
the members of the Security Council were talking about. They trusted you, and what you shared on it on, on, on every week was absolutely remarkable. How did that happen? How did you maintain those relationships? Well, I was in charge of the organization for a while, but I didn't invent it. So I can say it was a brilliant idea on the part of those who did. Um, and it came out of the recognition that what went on in the UN Security Council was extremely opaque, um, that it wasn't known often to member states in the General Assembly that weren't on the council. It wasn't known to civil society, uh, the academic community. And there needed to be some real transparency brought to what goes on, because 90% of what goes on in the Security Council goes on behind closed doors. It isn't in the public sessions that are webcast. It's in uh, private uh, consultations. Um, so the idea was to set up an organization that would make there were people who said, forget it, the permanent five members like it the way it is, they'll close you down, they, they won't let an organization bring greater transparency. Um, but there was a decision not to become a kind of Security Council watch that tried to tell the Security Council what to do on each individual issue, uh, but other member states, civil society organizations to use that information to do their own lobbying. And the, the first uh, head of the organization who'd been the permanent representative of New Zealand did a brilliant job in establishing its credibility. And so the way Security Council Report gets its information is by talking consistently to all 15 members of the Security Council, irrespective of their ideological position or their uh, position on particular issues. And they do all share information because to some extent they want their own perspectives to be reflected. Um, and Security Council Report puts that uh, out there. It's not true entirely to say that we have no views of our own. Um, Security Council report is very strongly on the side of a 15-member Security Council in which the 10 elected members uh, are not at such a great disadvantage as they are uh, against the five permanent members. Um, so in addition to what you can see by going on the website of all the public reporting of what goes on in the council, uh, these days uh, Security Council does a lot of training uh, of elected members um, uh, just before they come onto the council uh, in order to try to strengthen their role. And that's something that has been going on. It's very important because, you know, the dominance of the council by five permanent mm -hmm. members is anachronistic. Um, uh, and there are regions that are grossly underrepresented, um, Africa in particular, uh, emerging states that uh, need to have their voices heard. Um, and so, yes, I think Security Council Report is an important uh, way uh, in which um, constituencies. Well, before, you, yeah, go on. before we go into the next one, David, if I may, I just wanted to, to return this to you, Ian. Uh, what would you, because there's been talk always about the, uh, the, the five permanent members, and in fact even uh, swapping seats between countries and all that, what, what do you think about the, the concept of the permanent five? today in 2021 should it should it remain should it be scrapped what do you think it shouldn't the composition of the security council is out of date and should be reformed and almost everybody agrees with that or at least will say they agree with it um, one can doubt the sincerity of the permanent five when they say they agree with it because the present situation uh, gives exaggerated role the problem is that the membership as a whole can't agree on in what way it should be reformed. Yeah. Um, and the, the, way, the, the barriers to reform are very high. It requires two thirds of member states to vote through uh, a change in the charter. And that then has to be ratified uh, by two thirds, uh, including uh, the five permanent members. So in fact, the composition has only been changed once when the membership was expanded from 11 to, to, to 15. Um, and the problem is that for every country that thinks it should be a member, that applies particularly to India, Germany, Brazil, uh, and Japan, um, there's another country in their region uh, that actually doesn't want to see them on the on the council. Mm. And the African countries, which 
claim that they should have two permanent members themselves um, would have an extremely hard time choosing amongst their own members who those should be. So I'm afraid I don't think there's going to be uh, uh, a, a change in composition. Mm -hmm. But what that means is it's all the more important uh, that the council operates in a way that is still open to those who are underrepresented, underrepresented regions, emerging countries. Uh, and that's why um, what I would advocate very strongly is, and, and this is really what Security Council report is about, uh, is changes in the working methods of the Security Council uh, that open it much more to broader influence. Andrea, Andrea, back to sustainable development and your 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 proposals. The Security Council that acts or gets out of the way. Well, that's pretty fighting stuff, Ian, isn't it? That was from Andrea here. And the other the other point was. Uh, encouraging city leaders in richer countries to embrace the smart sustainable cities project in other words cities around the world cooperating more with each other um, andrea would you like to expand on one of those um i would like to ask ian what what uh, is his opinion about the first proposal having a global ceasefire how realistic is it I mean, the sad thing is that when uh, Secretary General Guterres made that call, uh, it got some support. The, the Security Council, as you rightly said, um, behaved deplorably in their own ability to rapidly come behind the call and put their political weight behind it. It was really a low point in terms of the squabbling amongst the, uh, the permanent members of the Security Council. Um, but I'm afraid it's also been extremely difficult to get warring parties on the ground to agree to it. Um, uh, and even in some cases, you know, the kind of distraction uh, of the, the pandemic from their internal situations may even have made some of them feel they have a sort of freer hand to continue their, uh, uh, their, their struggles. Um, so uh, it requires extremely active pressure uh, and that has to be different from conflict to conflict as to who really has the influence in the in the conflict i'm following libya particularly closely because that was the last place where i worked for the the un and there is a little bit of progress right now um, in uh, uh, de-escalation of the conflict and active negotiations um, but uh, uh, but we ought to have seen a coming together of the international community in support of the, the Secretary General's call, and I'm, I'm afraid we didn't see that. Yeah. Um, there is a question, unless Andrea has another one, uh, to Ian. It's, it's regarding the perception of the public at large of the United Nations. Uh, Amy asked the question, when the Security Council voted against the Iraq war, and this still went ahead. The UN mission in Iraq was attacked, despite Sergio Vierdmeyu stating that the UN was independent. Is there an issue about how the UN is understood and conveyed and, and how it is scapegoated? Do we still have Ian? Yes. There certainly is an issue. Um, you know, there was a time when the UN insignia afforded people working for the UN some protection in the field, the way that the Red Cross symbol uh, should provide protection to humanitarian uh, workers of the, the Red Cross. Unfortunately, what we've seen is more and more situations, not just Iraq, uh, where the UN has become a, a, a target. I, I think that is partly because the UN has become identified or seen not so much as you know, independent civil servants uh, working for the ideals of the Charter, um, but it's seen in terms of the member states that have dominated it over particular, uh, particular situations. Um, and for the UN to go back into Iraq uh, after the invasion of Iraq, uh, despite the lack of Security Council authority, was a very controversial decision within the UN itself. Um, mm. uh, but if the UN then is identified or is seen, I mean, it's quite wrong to see the UN as identified with the, uh, uh, the US and the UK who had uh, in invaded, that was the perception on the ground, then the UN becomes a, a, a target. Um, um, it's going to be very hard to roll that back, I'm afraid, and it has a very 
inhibiting effect in terms of what the UN can do on the ground, because one of the things that is rightly said about peace operations is they're often too remote from the people they're working among, um, but it's very hard to uh, be more engaged with communities if there are heavy security constraints. When, when I headed the mission in East Timor, we had people out in the villages with no real security, not even the security of good communications. The UN wouldn't be allowed to do that today because um, the, the, the threat is in many cases too, too great. To build on Amy's question, uh, it touches me personally because when uh, uh, Sergio Verenmeyer was my boss when he got killed in Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and when you were in Istimor, I think just before you were in, a, in Istimor or just after Karama, I was actually in West Timor two days before the UNHCR yeah. was attacked. And uh, a few members of the UNHCR attacked. And when you ask questions, the people there in West Timor and in Indonesia in general identified the UN with the oppressor. Uh, identified the UN with, with the new colonialism in many ways. It just shows how much, uh, I don't know if it's uh, disinformation or just the lack of the UN to stand out as an independent institution. But these misconceptions are still, you know, uh, rife everywhere. Sorry, um, I'd just like to, to uh, warn Isabella to say, prepare your question, Isabella. <clears throat> yeah. Just that point you mentioned. <laughs> But let me just say, here is the, I, I'd like to give a, sorry, the, I'd like to a positive the, the, example David, on Paul David, in yeah. response, though. Good. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, you mentioned West Timor, Salem. I, I went back to East Timor last year for the 20th anniversary of the, the self-determination referendum, and I'd had the privilege of heading the mission that ran that referendum. Um, and in East Timor, Timor-Leste as it is today, the UN is viewed extremely positively, um, particularly because of its role in uh, enabling the independence vote in very difficult circum security circumstances, also because of the role that Sergio Vera de Mello played as transitional administrator in the immediate transition to uh, self-government uh, after the independence vote. So. There are places where uh, the role the UN has played is, is recognized and positively recognized. Um, but uh, I, I'm afraid perhaps the larger trend is in the other direction. Especially with the peacekeepers. Well, yeah. that, that was why I was holding up rather the impartial soldier by Michael Harbottle, who was mentioned uh, by Autumn. Mm. And, um, in that this book, which is now 50 years old, of course, the UN was seen as impartial. Now it's very different. Um, Isabella, do you have a question? Just giving you a chance before we finish. Yes, thank you very yeah, much, David. Yeah, about five minutes. <laughs> I will try to be quick. Uh, hello, Ian. Um, my question, um, actually, um, because you come from the UN and have been there for years, and uh, I was talking about free, um, free flow of the information. And I was just wondering, during the years over there, you work with the UN, and when you uh, get out from there and you, you work for other um, uh, organizations, how do you think UN has uh, role modeled free flow of information? I mean, like how they actually um, deal with their own information sharing and at the same time to promote these ideas to the member states and also the governmental um, organizations as well. I, I think the UN has often been behind the curve in terms of the techniques of communication and sometimes its, uh, it's communication is rather, rather old-fashioned. Um, um, so I think that and, and you know, there hasn't been enough of what one calls strategic communications, uh, rather more kind of conventional uh, press and media operations, um, fairly slow to enter the social media world as well. So um, I, I, I think the UN comes out quite well in terms of the integrity of its information. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, it needs to be uh, ahead of the curve rather than behind the curve in how to reach uh, a wider public uh, with impartial information. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's very good thought of that. But also, 
um, back to to your role when you write the um, Security Council reports, does that actually um, enable you more to dig up the information and share with the public because of the purpose of that, or they actually have some barrier for you to actually to do the job? Um, no, we we we're able to get information, and and actually, Security Council reports as an independent NGO has a very good relationship with the. Uh, um, the, the, the Security Council department that supports the Security Council, they have to be extremely sensitive to making sure they don't upset uh, powerful member states. Um, so uh, the independence of Security Council report gives gives that more license to uh, um, put things in the public domain that are true, but which certain member states don't necessarily welcome having uh, uh, having put out there. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, my friends in the Secretariat in the Security Council Affairs Division certainly welcome the independent role outside because they have some constraints of their own. There, we have only about two minutes left, but there are a number of questions which are sort of more general, but I would just uh, want to, I'm going to, to, to mention some of them. Uh, why is there reluctance by the UN member states to use the mechanism of uniting for peace formula when the UN the Security Council failed to act? Should, uh, why is Security Council stymied? Should not the General Assembly uniting for peace resolution be used and restart trust th territories uh, for part of Somalia and Syria? Uh, the R2P, uh, why can the UN do more to encourage US and Russia to renew the new START agreement by February? These are all uh, lots of questions and we only have about a minute. I'm sorry and I apologize, <laughs> but uh, everybody wanted to hear you. So if you have probably a couple of words to uh, round up and, 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 and if you have a message for all of us, that would be great. And, uh, and then take it. Well, I'm, I'm delighted that Uniting for Peace has been emphasized because I myself very strongly feel that more use should be made of Uniting for Peace. And I think Syria is a very clear case where because the Security Council has been blocked by repeated vetoes, um, that should have been taken into the General Assembly. And one wonders, I mean, we should push this question with the UK government because I think they've been more concerned to preserve the prerogatives of the P5 and not see things slip away from the Security Council into the General Assembly than they have to use the General Assembly in a, in a positive way. Um, and the one thing we can do, and UNA UK can play an extremely important role in doing, uh, is influence the behavior of our own government at the, at the UN. Uh, and it is time for a shift uh, away from you know, saying we're great, we're one of the five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, we punch above our weight, uh, to recognizing that we should uh, uh, play a role in which we engage with the broader membership uh, much more positively and form many more alliances than we, than we do. Yeah. And probably all our uh, participants here who are outside the United Kingdom with their own countries as well. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't Every know if, if Isabella or David or uh, Andrea would like to add something just before, uh, because we have basically one minute by the end, uh, before I, I really offer a fantastic I, <laughs> vote of thanks I, to Ian. I, I, David, if you have I would, I would, No, my only comment is, what a wonderful collection of questions we've, we've had. I mean, they, they've been brilliant. Um, yeah. And uh, we, we're out, I'm sorry. Aisha is, is certainly writing them all down. And uh, they will not be forgotten. Our rapporteur. I assure all of our rapporteur, that's right. So, um, well done, everybody. And thank you. This is my thank you to you all. And thank you to those who stuck with us. It's been so important, yes. Ian, to hear what you said. So, thank you very much. And uh, good night for those who are here. And good morning, good afternoon for all the others around the world. <laughs>